Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report, August 6th, Part 2, the Mars Science Lab Landing. Well, you couldn't ask for any more perfect of a landing. Thousands of things that had to take place took place exactly the way they should, not the least of which were 76 pyrotechnic explosions that had to take place and be timed perfectly, any of them going wrong, and the whole thing could have totally been a catastrophe. So I will have to say, let's give NASA a 10 out of 10 for this. It seems like stuff to do with Mars. They've been calling it right, and they've been getting it right. And so many things have been working against them lately, too. When you consider the fact that even to get some of the pictures back, they had to time things perfectly. I remember the associate director, John Grunsfeld, was talking about the Odyssey Orbiter had to actually be in the right position, even though it had one reaction wheel going bad, and they had to actually learn to drive it again. It had to be in the exact right position for us to be able to even get the first thumbnail pictures that they did get to confirm the landing. It showed the picture of the wheel. I'll put it up here for you to take a look at. These were rather low-resolution pictures just due to the fact that this is a craft that was put in service in 2001 compared to the other craft that they're going to be using to send us pictures called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. There's a picture that it had as the flyover, too. It was not able to, because of the position it was at, give the, the uh, landing picture, but it was also able to give a picture of the craft coming down on its parachute, and that was a pretty decent picture, too. Now, that being a 2006 satellite, has much better capabilities of being able to receive data at a higher rate and being able to send more high-resolution images to us a lot quicker. But both craft can actually be used to do this, so it worked out really great. You have to also remember that at the exact time these things were happening, there was actually an Earth set on Mars. In other words, the Earth was actually dropping below the horizon, and there was no direct line-of-sight communications just shortly thereafter. So all of this had to be done precisely, robotically, basically, like one of the guys said. As soon as it enters the atmosphere, we're basically just like the viewers. We're just sitting back and watching everything happen and hope every preparation we made comes to pass exactly the way we expected it to, which it did. So I will give NASA a 10 out of 10 on this one. Now a little bit later, I will get into my rant too. There are some problems I do have because of the fact this was one of the greatest events, I think, in the history of NASA since the moon landings, and this is what's going to generate any necessary enthusiasm if we ever are going to have a Mars program that involves live astronauts. I do have some fault that I will talk about a little bit later in my rant. But meanwhile, as a second thing, I know some of you have watched some of my past TDD reports, and I have a couple of times reported on Steampunk. Well, a buddy of mine, 54 Shadow, is part of a group that works on bicycles, and they kind of have little friendly competitions among themselves for developing different kind of custom bicycles. Well, what he came up with was a Steampunk bicycle. It's kind of a combination of decorative elements and useful elements kind of combined together to make it look, I don't know, you call it modern retro, I guess. But anyway, I'm going to have the link down below to his video showing off his steampunk bicycle, and I would like you to check it out if you haven't seen it already. There will also be a link down below to the one broadcast that I think NASA did very good with. This was the broadcast on their YouTube channel. That's the NASA YouTube channel, and the link down below to take you to that to watch. It's about... Uh, just under 10 minutes, I think 9 minutes and something video. That was fairly well done. I'll give them a 6 out of 10 on that one. What they should have done, really, you'll hear in the last part of the video, a couple of narrators come on explaining things. I wish they would have done that from the very beginning. That would have made it a little bit better so that people could know what's exactly going on with it. But, yeah, I'll give them a better than average of that. I'll give them a rating of 6 out of 10. So, right after this, stay tuned for my NASA rant. So, if you don't want to hear my NASA rant, you can skip that part. I won't mind. Okay, thank you those of you that stayed with me for my uh, NASA rant that's coming up right now. Now, while the engineering, while all of the different science parts of it came out better, you couldn't, uh, came out excellent as best as they could be, you couldn't expect any better from the engineering, from the accomplishing what they needed to accomplish, 10 out of 10 all the way. But yet I have one problem with NASA, and that is their public relations. Since 2008, which was about the last time they actually put forth any kind of educational effort, especially on the NASA channel. If you'll notice, if you're a direct TV subscriber, you'll notice the NASA channel has actually been dumped from your basic package. You'll have to pay, I think, an extra $15 more to get the NASA channel. 
I don't really miss it because I tell you what, if you look at the rehash of all the old science shows, some of them going back 10 years or more, it's basically a rehash of the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, why do you have a public broadcast channel like that and use it in such an abysmal way? If you also talk about online, when I went to the NASA Live channel, this is this morning I'm talking about, immediately after the landing, what do I see on the NASA Live channel? I see the associate director there doing a one-way news conference to where you don't even hear the questions he's being asked. You see him smiling at the camera for about two minutes, and then he starts answering a question, and you have to somehow guess what the question when he was asked. This was not a private channel. This is the NASA Live channel. You go to the Curiosity channel this morning, and what do you see? You see a rehash over and over again of the pre-landing interviews with the guys that they've been doing for days. I mean, come on, you got to get with it a little bit better than that. This is the modern era of technology. This is the modern era of communication. Um, like I said, I give them, uh, like I said previously in my TDD report, I give them a little credit for at least the post on the YouTube channel was halfway decent. I would call it better than average. But NASA, you've got to get with it in the public relations department. I mean, if you get people that can actually get enthusiastic about watching a pseudoscience show on Discovery Channel or one of the Discovery Channels, I forget which one it is, about searching for Bigfoot, you have two guys and a girl out in the middle of the woods at night basically acting like they're scared when a cow walks by and people think that's interesting enough to where the show has increased its budget and they're going international next year for that come on I mean NASA you can generate some enthusiasm too you can make your channel better you can actually make your channel every bit as good as Discovery uh, if nothing else let some of your fan base let people from Make Magazine let people from various astronomy channels things like that have a little bit of airtime on there too sure maybe you will have to review their stuff before posting it up there but my gosh you've got so much hours of airtime that could be put to a great use promoting science projects promoting things like that I mean you are just doing a total abysmal job in public relations I remember back when the two smaller rovers were uh, first put on the surface too and I wrote a letter to NASA this is the old fashioned fashion postal type of letter no response whatsoever not even so much as a postcard this time I emailed when they wanted it. They're talking about they want to interface with the public a little bit more. So I emailed with a question about the Curiosity Lander. Did I even get a response that my email was even received from NASA? No. I mean, that's a matter of even you can set up a robot to do that. Let's look at three, three scientists, just as an example here. Let's look at Carl Sagan. Let's look at Neil Tyson. And let's look at Brian Cox. These three guys are pretty decent scientists. I mean, they're, they're ca capable scientists, but they've not really discovered anything really fantastic. I mean, as far as the science part, they probably wouldn't be considered in the top 10 or even the top 100 of sciences, scientists. But why does everybody know about them? Because they're excellent communicators. If you're talking about scientist communicators, these guys are absolutely excellent. Carl Sagan, as a matter of fact, when I was a teenager, I wrote a letter to him at Cornell University, and he actually not only responded to my letter, he actually sent me a book, free of charge, no charge, no nothing. I mean, it's about reaching out and making science interesting to the American people. If you don't get the American people interested in science, the money is going to dry up. I know when your budgets are cut to the bone, such as they are in NASA, you want to just pull back and make it nothing but pure science. But that's going to be like shooting yourself in the foot. If the people are not interested, how are you going to get the money in the future? How are you going to go before the congressmen that are looking for votes from the general public and they're saying the general public doesn't really care about science that much or even know about it that much? How are you going to get more money to do anything, let alone a Mars program of sending astronauts there? You have to get the people interested in the first place. That should be the last place you ever cut a budget. You could hire a staff, for example, five people, let's say hire five, five people out of the staff that get people interested in shows like this Bigfoot show. Hire people like that that know how to get people interested in something that's even pseudoscience to start with. Have those kind of people along with maybe a staff of college interns working for minimum wage or maybe even working for free just to get experience with NASA and make NASA interesting and fascinating with people. This is real science. NASA does so many things. You could have set up webcams and had broadcasts going on while this thing was being developed. I mean, while they were building, while they were putting it together, while they were testing the sky crane, all of the things to do with curiosity. You could have built up such an audience that these people would have been waiting on the edge of their chairs just to see this stuff go on. And we would have had ten times the audience we had now and ten times the interest. So that's the end of my rant right now. NASA, I would really like 
you to get your act back together. I'm one of your biggest fanboys. I want to I want to see you succeed. I want to see before I pass away. I want to see in my lifetime. I want to see astronauts actually walking on Mars. So here's hoping somebody will see it and somebody will listen. But thanks for listening to my rant.